Dang, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. All right. Hey, so everybody, it is week five. Uh, it's Thursday, so this is lecture. Um, well, it's the, it's the first lecture today. I'm going to give three three little 20-minute segments, and I uh, just want to start off by going over the, the syllabus. And there were also a couple questions on uh, the exam. So, um, yeah, so here's, um, here's summary two. And I'll, um, again, so we got, we got a few things to do uh, today. Hopefully by now everyone's finished um, exam two. We'll, we'll take a quick peek at, um, at summary two. And again, just to go over the due dates, um, this is not due. Well, you can turn it in today if you've already done it, but just make sure it's in by Tuesday is all. So, uh, so here we are. End of week five, um, starting week six, I'm going to cover the coal chapter. I know Tim started in on it, but I'll just uh, I'll, I'll finish that up. Before we do, um, I do want to look at the exam, and I don't. And again, there's um, in, in Moodle uh, there are several question types, so I'll just go over that with you. Because I, I, this, and this happens every year in, in uh, Moodle, but obviously you've got your true false. There's a few of those, and you get two chances, so. You better get all the true-false right. <laughs> it's usually not the best assessment tool if you have two chances. There are, uh, you know, multiple choice. There are typically four answers there, and, um, you know, usually on the, by the second try, you'll, you'll nail those. There are also some essay. You don't see too many of those, but I'll ask for an essay. Just, you know, give me your, give me your thoughts. How well can you articulate something? There's also numerical where I give you a you know, word problem, math problem, you need to put a number in the blank. The, the, one, the, the, the one that seems to be the most innocent and innocuous, though, is the one that gives everybody a hard time, and that's the short answer, because I think there was a question on there where the, the question was heat capacity. Um, there's another uh, term for it, which is just the specific heat capacity or specific heat, et cetera. So if you don't spell that exactly right or get it exactly right, Moodle's going to count it wrong. So, you know, you start pulling your hair out and saying, I know I know this. So um, I apologize on behalf of Moodle. What, I, what I've typically done in the past, uh, you know, and even, like sometimes someone will misspell the word calorie. I'll go back just to save my own grief and that of the students is just put in all of the nearly correct answers so that Moodle gets it. But uh, anyway, my Apologies for that. Any other questions on the other exam? Okay. All right, so let's get into to the Moodle shell. I haven't been in there uh, myself in a little while, so let's back up and do that, and then we'll get into uh, Nicole. That was one that I was curious about the answer to. Uh huh. Um, where it was uh, what is the best fuel that says that all arms um, are. Individual particles? Yeah, that they're all individual particles in, in the atomists. Yeah, I thought it was atomism. Or, or atomic theory. Yeah, that's what it turned out. Was that another short answer deal? Yeah. Okay. It was atomism 2,000 years ago when it started. Okay. Yeah. What do they call it now? It's uh, the atomic theory. The atomic atomic theory, now. theory? I think you just oh. call it, yeah, atomic theory. But if you're calling <laughs> atomistic theory, that's, yeah, we're not going to grade grammar, so yeah, and I don't, the fact that there's like separate theories, one called the autonomous or the, yeah, yeah so, the autonomous theory, no, <laughs> the autonomous atom theory, uh, so no, that, that'll be one we'll just go and, uh, and grade. Okay, yeah, absolutely, and the other question, is there a, uh, is there a week five forum? Shoot, I, I you know what, I'm sorry, I, I did ask Peter to go ahead and move all of these problem sets around so they match the syllabus. I, I, I just need to give them a little little clearer instruction. Problem set two is not due this week. <laughs> so problem set two is not due this week. It's still sitting in the shell and, and uh, you know my apologies for not uh, being more on top of that. I asked Peter to move that for me. Anyway, um, and then if, if these lectures um, are still working, these are previous years lectures as, as you can see in the shell 
Um, I've just I've been labeling these as lectures 2016, like the one I'm giving now. But there's also plenty of great information. These, you know, this is the gosh 11th semester I've taught this course. Uh, we used to use iTunes U, and that service went away. And unfortunately, that information is lost forever. But uh, anyway, we'll we'll see how long YouTube lasts until somebody. I mean, I, I don't know where all of those servers are, but um, one thing I did learn a few years ago just about the, the power of the Google is, so, you know, you've got the Internet, which is basically, you know, in theory, all of the public servers or, you know, even private servers, people who want to share their information, wherever they happen to be, computers across the globe. And I've had my own little website going, it's just this little guy, and it's just a bunch of links that I use for various things. I've had this thing going since 1995, you know, it's just kind of a big mess, but it's, you know, it's my mess, so I can, I can use it. And I'm sitting on the, at a Unix prompt and accidentally delete my HTML code, gone, like RM minus R. But, and so my IT guy at the time was just go out and check out the Google cache for it. So, you know, cache is in C-A-C-H-E, and they had it. They had the whole thing. It was a week or two old, but I then realized, like, Google is constantly copying the Internet. They have their own copy of the Internet. So, kind of why. Just a little, little side note there on where, where is it? Where are the files? Well, they're, and, and you know, they don't just have one copy. They got, yeah, so if they, you know, LA gets bombed, well, they probably got another copy over in uh, Shanghai or whatever. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so let's just take a peek at summary two. I think by now you kind of know the drill on the summaries. Um, not everybody submitted their summary one on time. If you, if you submitted it after the, uh, the due date and you're anxious to get it back, um, I will grade the late summary ones when I grade summary two. So get your, um, just get your summary two uh, to me by, by Tuesday. And we'll just take a quick peek at that. Um, and again, the, the only forum, the question was what's, what's the forum look like? Summary two is the forum. So, oh, okay. send, you know, put, do your draft, do your draft summary, um, pop it up there. And you know what you might even do if you're just sitting at the computer, I wouldn't always recommend this, um, but you might just pop a draft of your summary into the forum without messing around with Microsoft Word and all that, get some quick feedback, and then put your final draft into Word and upload that to the, to the grading uh, site. Just, you know, a suggestion, you know, you know, take it or leave it. All right, so this guy, these are um, um, a couple chemical engineers out of, oh, where are these guys? Italy, both out of Italy. Tola, Petinau, power plant generation with carbon capture and storage. So what exactly does that mean? Well, so here's your, um, here's your coal plant. And if you've ever been by coal strip, I mean, they actually do look exactly like this. They're just big, uh, big, big cubes with two two or more pipes sticking out the top. There's really not a whole lot. There's a lot going on inside, obviously. But you have your, um, you have your coal uh, typically coming in on some kind of uh, conveyor system. You've got your uh, boilers inside. Um, and you've got turbines, obviously. And we'll get into the details here in a little bit. Turbines. You know, and then out, uh, you know, out come your uh, power lines. But uh, so there's there's the the good stuff you know the electricity coming out that we that we pay ten cents a kilowatt hour for, but this but out the out the stack, uh, you you've got um, you got CO2, you've got H2O, you've got uh, SOX. Where does the sulfur? Why is there sulfur in coal? Where does sulfur come? Yeah, but why why is there sulfur in mineral deposits? Why isn't it titanium or something? Yeah, but where's it coming from? 
Yeah, it's coming from. And here's here's the fun, the kind of the fun fact to know about uh, coal. I mean, it is, it is biomass. It's very old biomass. And if you go up and look up the amino acids, um, you take a peek here. I like to just kind of dig down into the into the molecular level. Um, there's 20. Uh, there's 20 amino acids, and hopefully you can see this okay. But um, one of these guys, cysteine, proline cysteine. There it is. So that's so all life relies on amino acids. That's you know the proteins that make uh, little nano machines that are our bodies. There's your sulfur right there. Um, so it's it's in biology. You know, we, it, it's it's a part of life. There's also uh, NOx. And what's what? Why? What's what's going on with the X there? Why is that X sitting there? Oxide. It's not oxide. Well, so right here on on this guy, so this so carbon dioxide is carbon one, oxygen two, um, H two O is hydrogen two, oxygen one. So so carbon dioxide looks you know looks like this. It's got that double bond. We've talked about that. Water uh, looks like this single bond with the H's hanging off the side. SOX just means you might have you might have SO, you might have SO2, you might have SO3, etc. Uh, same thing, NO you might have NO, you might have NO2, you might have NO3, you might have N2O3, etc. A lot of different ways to stick these things together. And you know they have varying degrees of stability. You might even, um, you know, you, you, there might be cases even where, you, where you're getting ozone coming out, O3, great in the upper atmosphere, not so good on uh, on, on ground level. So all of these fun fancy uh, molecules could be uh, coming out the top. But the the whole point of this paper. Whole point of this, this paper is so we, you know, we, and to some extent, we we fixed the uh, SOX and the NOx problems. We'll explore that chemistry at the end of the chapter, but you know the the um, 800 gram, you know, pound gorilla, if you will, is 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 this guy right here, you know, and this this is what's always in the news and the EPA is this is a pollutant. Well, how can it how can it be a pollutant if plants need it to live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but. So this is what this paper is all about. We're going to capture carbon because we, you know, to a, to a large extent, like I said, acid rain kind of solved it. Acid rain kind of solved it. Uh, water, greenhouse gas, but why wouldn't you want a few more clouds in the sky? You know, <laughs> unless, unless you've watched too much uh, Blade Runner. I don't know if you saw the movie Blade Runner, where it's like raining all the time because uh, greenhouse gases are always spewing. But yes. So is the water polluted with the SOS? Is the water polluted? Well, it's a good, it's a really good question. So, you know, what's the smallest unit of water? Well, it's right there. You know, the smallest unit of water is one water molecule. And um, I think, I mean, the short answer is yes, it can be. You know, if you have particulates in the air, uh, you know, frequently that can trigger rain. Uh, and there's even some kind of interesting theories about um, even even microbes that are airborne. Uh, sticking and forming a um, just a nucleation site for water droplets. So there's theories where every single water droplet has like a piece of dust in it, or a virus in it, or a bacteria, etc. You know, some little um, crud or crust. So, yeah. So these these things are mixed mixed together, and yeah, absolutely they can be. They can sort of be mixed together in a in a in a soup or a stew. But you know, yeah. So that answer your question. So at the very small scale, you're never going to corrupt or pollute a single water molecule, Maybe but yeah, a raindrop, yeah, but a raindrop, which is say, you know, 90, 90 percent uh, water could have some other crud in it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what these guys, they're looking at is uh, carbon capture and storage. Sometimes in the, in the popular media or the technical literature, you'll see this as CCUS, so carbon capture, utilization, and storage. 
So capture would just mean, hey, we're going to stick it in a bottle somewhere, uh, pipe it between, and there's a 200 mile pipe going right now between Wyoming and Montana for enhanced oil recovery. So big old pipe of CO2 underground because you're going to do something with it. Well, let's, let's pump it underground so we can bring up more oil, kind of a fracking equivalent, if you will. So that's, um, so that's an example. It, you know, so just bottling it would be, let's, you know, let's bottle it and sell it in, you know, bicycle tire inflation kits or pellet gun cartridges, et cetera. Um, utilization, well, enhanced oil recovery would be one. You can also imagine pumping it into greenhouses. Uh, you know, plants, you, you can get greenhouses up to 1,000, 1,300 ppm. The Earth's atmosphere is at an average of 400 right now. So utilization would be send it back to plant life in a controlled manner. Uh, sequestration <coughs> or storage, same thing, sequestration, storage. And there are, uh, when we get further along in the, in the book, it might just be, you know, pumping it deep underground. There's a project here in Montana at the Keevan Dome. I'll just show you that really quick. It's spelled like Kevin, but it's Keevan, Keevan Dome. So there's a big uh, dome of rock underground, and, and the experiment is to say, you know, can we just pump it underground and leave it there for approximately ever. Uh, yeah, we danger. With that danger. Nobody. Yeah, because there, there have been other issues, even with natural formations. There's a lake in Africa with an uh, active volcano under it, and there are gases like CO2, and this thing, you know, burps or erupts. CO2 is heavier than air, and when it flows down the mountainside, it, it kills everything in, in its wake. So. Uh, yeah, it's like kind of a gaseous landfill that just kind of like, oh, let's just wait, wait, wait for the future generations to... Almost like throwing <laughs> gasoline on a fire. Or like pumping an air, pumping a room full of CO2 with a bunch of people living in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Creating a dead zone instead of, a, yeah. So anyway, so what these, what these guys are, are looking at, so obviously, um, you know, no technology is free, and so this is why they call it a techno-economic comparison. So some type of technology is going to capture, store, utilize the CO2. And does it have a market value? Yeah. You can, you, you can go down to Norco right now and, and buy, a, buy a bottle of CO2. You can go out and buy dry ice. There's, all, you know, all, there's, a, there's a market for carbon dioxide. So can, you know, can you make it pay for itself is, is the question. So what I'd like you to focus on with this paper, um, uh, do, do take a look, a look at some of this uh, here. Ultimate analysis by weights. We've done some chemistry so far. Um, here's here's uh, percentage by weight of fixed carbon volatile matter or any gases that are going to come out, and then ash is sort of what's, uh, what's left behind, and this is just South African coal, you can do the same thing. And moisture, that's your, that's your water uh, that's, that's still trapped in there. Heating value, uh, by now you should be pretty familiar with this, what a, what a megajoule is, what a kilogram is, so if, if you were going to live off of coal, if your body somehow had the ability to metabolize coal instead of cheeseburgers. Um, this much coal would last you two and a half days. Just a kilogram, you know, just a little couple, couple pounds of coal. Makes sense. That's, that's the energy density. And, and so now, by now you've read summary one and you know what energy density is and, and there it is for, for coal. So, and, and another thing I, I would really want to stress while I have your attention is in these papers I want you to be as um, quantitative as you can. Put some numbers in there. Don't be afraid of the numbers. You know, talk about it, especially uh, since we're talking techno-economics. So here's your, here's your tech. <coughs> and then where, where, are your, where are the economics? Well, the economics are right here. Uh, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. 
right? But you also have to realize that somebody Somebody, Warren Buffett, whoever, rich person, uh, put a lot of money into the coal plant in the first place. They don't just build themselves, right? You know, millions of dollars. Um, a lot of times when you're looking, and we'll get into this a little later, but a lot of times when you're looking at um, economics, if, let's just say uh, coal strip, it's a 2.2 .2 gigawatt facility. You can build a, if you can build a facility for two or three bucks a watt, you're doing pretty well. Solar, solar cells, like the ones behind you there in the, in the classroom, are, are under a dollar a watt now, just the cells. So you can now look and see, you know, so if, if I was going to build a solar farm versus a power plant, what's the dollar per watt? So, you know, 2.2 gigawatts, you can pretty much bet that this is a, you know, you know in today's dollar, you know, 10 to 20 billion dollar facility, you know, so 10 would be five bucks a watt, 20 would be about 10 bucks a watt, and that's approximately what it would have taken to build. You put 10 billion dollars in, <coughs> now you're kind of going to want those 10 billion and then some back. So if you're a venture capitalist, why would you, you're not, a, you're not a giving your money away, you need it back so you can then build the next project, whatever that was to be. As it turns out, yeah, well, that's how it works. Uh, Perpet no, no, perpetual I'm motion of money, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's how it works. So, um, but as it turns out, as we'll see, um, and it'd be great to see some of your comments on this in your forum, coal is not, is not doing well at all these days. So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Well, it remains to be seen. Okay, well, let's, let's just dive into the chapter. This is just very simple. Uh, you know, very simple combustion. Obviously, coal can be used for heat, no problem. Set it on fire, we all know that. A lot of carbon in there, CO2, uh, comes off as a result. Very early coal heating example. Um, back in the, the good old days, you know, before there were power plants, there was, uh, I don't know, dis you might call it distributed heating, where, you know, people had coal in their houses, and then all of a sudden there's the pea soup fog in London, and hey, let's get this stuff kind of moved uh, further out away from us, and that's kind of where, you know, where we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a fairly substantial way right now. But this is kind of, again, just kind of the early days of industrial coal use, and, and again, as you well know, this is a British perspective on the, uh, the coal industry, so that's kind of what you might have seen in the British countryside. Later in the book, we'll talk about peak oil. And right there's your example of, of peak coal. The UK just, just literally put their last chunk of coal in a museum. I, I, I just, oh yeah, I was just listening to the, to the news, you know, maybe sometime late last year, like, yeah, we have a museum. The very last chunk we mined is now Sitting because they, they mine it all. It's gone. Um, no, you might say, well, come on, it's not all gone. Well, yeah, there's, I'm sure there's some fragments down there, but um, in, after reading summary one, you know, there's this whole energy return on energy invested. If it's going to cost you more energy to go get it than you're going to get from it, you just, you just uh, leave it the quality there. Quality of the coal has a lot to do with it, too. Beg your pardon? The quality of the coal has a lot The quality does, too, yeah. So typically, lower quality coal is going to have even less energy, so there's even less incentive to go after it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Good point. All right, so now we get a little bit into the chemistry of, of coal itself. And what we're looking at here is ultimate analysis of a sample of dry, ash-free, medium sulfur, good quality, bituminous coal. So we're looking at the um, percentages by mass. And this shouldn't be that surprising. I mean, obviously, what, you, what you're after there is is the carbon. You know why? You know why are you after it? Because that's what's allowing the combustion to happen. So what the main chemical reaction we're after here is just carbon plus O2 becomes um, C CO2. Pretty simple. 
and you know, and and heat comes off as well. So that's that's you know why we're, why we're sort of after this um, after this carbon because there's it's an exothermic chemical reaction when carbon and oxygen meet to form CO2. I already told you why um, there's some sulfur in there. Where's the nitrogen coming from? The air. Well, maybe. Uh, let's go back to our let's go back to our amino acids. Yeah, also there's a bunch of nitrogen kicking around in biology too. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's um, it, it's it's the it's the it forms DNA. You know, all of the plant matter that formed coal also had DNA, so there's nitrogen in there. Um, oxygen. There it is. Oxygen. 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 You know, there, there's oxygen. We are we are made of these. You know, all living uh, organisms are made of these elements. Hydrogen. Yeah, lots of hydrogen. So basically, what we're looking at here in this coal is a is a sort of a macro scale of the fundamental building blocks of life. Really old biomass. <laughs> okay, but um, so this is just by mass. If you went and weighed it, uh, what's going on with hydrogen? Why why do we see so much hydrogen? In that bottom graph. Of water in it. Well, you know, there is some water. Yep, there's going to be a little bit of water in there for sure. But but why is the blue? Um, why is the blue slice of pie on the bottom bigger than the blue slice of pie on the top? <clears throat> well, no, it's the same chunk of coal. Oh, it's it's the same, same exact chunk of coal. So is it one Nope, after. same chunk of coal. It's not before and after. Nope. Yeah, no, this is a good problem. This is a good question. Good question. So let's take a look at it. Here is the chunk, and we'll just look at it. Uh, sort of two-dimensionally. And I just, just told you, or the, the book just told you that, and we'll just, just look at carbon and hydrogen for now. So I'm just going to say we've got 88% uh, uh, carbon. And then what was the percentage on hydrogen? 5%. So here's, here's your 5% uh, hydrogen. And here's just... Uh, Here's the others. Others. Uh, so you've got your nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. Now, inside of this are a lot of little carbon atoms. Inside of this are a bunch of little hydrogen atoms. And you know the the atoms themselves. Let's just go. Let's go look at that. Um, My favorite, Tyler's new favorite too, dynamic periodic table. <laughs> um, somewhere in here, there's actually a, um, there's actually the radius of the individual atom. I don't know if you can see this so well or not, I'll, I'll read it to you. but. Um, this is telling me that hydrogen has a radius of 53 picometers. Um, NP phase E, so, so nano is 10 to the minus 9th, pico is 10 to the minus 12th meters, you know, it's just an order of mag magnitude, three orders of magnitude smaller than a nanometer. We can go down here, let's look at, let's look at carbon. Carbon's over here somewhere, 6. Uh, 67 picometers. You know, and all these other ones, aluminum's a little bigger, 118, iron a little bigger. But in general, so hydrogen, I, I think it's probably going to be the smallest at, at 53. Let's see what helium is. 31, actually helium's a little tighter. Those two electrons form a little, little, little smaller, tighter um, orbital. But in general, you know, everything's sort of, you know, 50, maybe in the hundreds. So the atoms themselves are not uh, very different when I say 50 uh, picometers. <clears throat> and I'm having some handwriting issues today. Picometers. Here's carbon at 67 pico. 
meters. But where's, where's most of the mass in the atoms themselves? All the mass is in the nucleus. The protons. And the protons, yeah. So if you, if you keep digging down in there, you'll, you'll see that um, you've got your six protons all, and your six neutrons in carbon uh, all just, you know, jammed in that, that nucleus. But overall, you know, 67 picometers will draw this, this guy, uh, 50 picometers uh, will draw this guy. There's just a single proton, no neutrons in hydrogen. So if we go back to our, our figure now, there can be a lot, there can be, you know, nearly as many hydrogen atoms, they, they just don't weigh as much. <coughs> they, they're, they're one twelfth the mass. So this is how many, and this is how much it weighs. It's just, you know, think feathers and bowling balls. You know, the, the carbons are the bowling balls and the, and the hydrogen are the feathers. You got all, you know, a bunch of feathers in there, but they just, they don't add up to much weight. So that, that's how to think of this figure. Make sense now? Good. Okay. All right. So again, there are, um, you know, like I said before, coal is just really old biomass. Um, anthracite sort of being, you know, the oldest or the one that's been cooking the longest. That's the, that's the cake that you left in the oven for too long and you take it out and it's just, it's just carbon because you cooked off all the water, you cooked off all the sugars, and now you just got a chunk of carbon left in your, in your oven. The best coal. There you go. That's the best coal. Yeah, that, that burnt cake in the oven. There it is. Uh, anthracite. Um, I made some good coal. There you go. <laughs> um, your air-dried wood and your air-dried peat. Uh, you know, peat, again, is just, is just, you know, wood or straw or other biomass. It's just kind of been sitting there cooking, but not as long. So just, just, just think of this as, as um, you know, wood going from very young to very old. Kind of simple. Not a, not a whole lot to it. So these, you know, these are, these are sort of named or graded, but each, each of these names are very um, artificial names so we can just talk, you know, talk about it. Same thing, you go to the uh, fueling station and, and you've got your 87, 89, high octane, etc. You can think of it the, the same way. So this is more or less a measurement of Oh, what's in there? What, what's going on in the ash? What, what's in the ash? Any ideas? This is actually kind of wild. I, I, I've been studying this a little bit recently just to ed educate myself. But the ash, um, you're looking at um, Fe, O2. So you're looking at rust. You're looking at uh, titanium dioxide. You're looking at silicon dioxide. So these are all metals. And is iron found in life? Yeah. Um, titanium, maybe not so much. You know, it just it was sort of like there in the rocks and diffused in. Silicon, yeah, you do need silicon to live. So these are, um, these are metals. There's also, um, there's also uh, S, gosh, there's another, it's something like S2O3. Don't quote me on that, but there, there's kind of a wild-looking uh, sulfur compound that's that's in um, ash as well. So that's what that's what's going on in these different. Uh, so you can think, there, you know, there's your water, there's your gases, there's your solids, and this is sort of the slag, the ash pond that that coal strip is having trouble with, and Duke Energy is having trouble with. I mean, none of it's um, well. I shouldn't say it, none of it's toxic. Um, Everything's toxic. You know, you take a big breath of water, toxic <laughs> to your lungs. <laughs> but, um, you know, in general, there's nothing really toxic about <coughs> rust. I mean, titanium dioxide is in, um, in, in sunscreen and silicon dioxide. It's actually, you can go and look at your vitamins. It, it, it's, it's there, but um, it's just a matter of how it's, how it's used. Mercury is, is going to end up in this volatile matter. Uh, mercury, very low melting temperature, and that's a big problem. If you send that stuff up the smokestack, you're, you're in trouble. Okay. Let's see, what else do we want to cover here? 
Well, let's just take, let's take one little break here, and then we'll kind of get into some of the technology. So we've looked at, we've taken a look at the chemistry. I've mentioned some of the, uh, we, we took a very brief look at the, at the summary, uh, of, you know, a very brief look at, you know, the so-called techno, here's your tech, and here's your economics. Uh, we've also just done a little bit of a, atomic theory here, looking at uh, mass versus number of atoms, talked a little bit about ash, and now we'll dig into some of the, uh, the technologies. Okay, take a quick break. Back from our sponsor.